Henry Cromwell. Henry Cromwell, 20 January 1628, 23 March 1674, was the fourth son of Oliver Cromwell and Elizabeth Birchier, and an important figure in the parliamentarian regime in Ireland. Biography Early Life Henry Cromwell, the fourth son of Oliver Cromwell, was born at Huntingdon on 20 January 1628. He was educated at Felsted School and Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Military career Henry Cromwell entered the New Model Army towards the close of the First Civil War and was in 1647 either a captain in Harrison's regiment or the commander of Fairfax's lifeguard, Heath, and would identify him with the commandant of the lifeguard. In the summer of 1648, Henry Cromwell appears to have been serving under his father in the north of England. In February 1650, Cromwell had attained the rank of colonel and followed his father to Ireland with reinforcements. He and Lord Broghill defeated Lord Inchiquin near Limerick in April 1650. In 1653, Cromwell was nominated one of the representatives of Ireland in the Barebones Parliament. Political career On 22 February 1654, Henry Cromwell was enrolled in Gray's and this was merely an honorary registration. After the dissolution of that parliament and the establishment of the protectorate, his father dispatched him to Ireland on a mission of inquiry to discover the feelings of the Irish officers towards the new government and to counteract the influence of the Anabaptists. He reported that the army in general, with the exception of the Anabaptists, were well satisfied with the recent change, and recommended that Ludlow, of whose venomous discontent and reproachful utterances he complains, should be replaced as lieutenant general by John Disborough. Charles Fleetwood, though a staunch supporter of the protectorate, he regarded as too deeply involved with the Anabaptist party to be safely continued in Ireland, and advised his recall to England after a time, and the appointment of Disborough to act as his deputy. Before leaving Ireland, he held a discussion with Ludlow on the lawfulness of the protectorate, which the latter has recorded at length in his memoirs. In August 1654, a new Irish council was commissioned, and the Council of State voted that Cromwell should be appointed commander of the Irish army and a member of the new council. This appointment seems to have been made at the request of Lord Broghill and other Irish gentlemen. In spite of this pressure, it was not till 25 December 1654 that Cromwell became a member of the Irish Council, though the date of his commission as Major General of the Forces in Ireland was 24 Aug. The cause of this delay was probably Cromwell's reluctance to advance his sons C. Carlyle, Cromwell letter CX6 whatever the protector's intentions may have been, and there are several references in the letters of John Thurlow and Henry Cromwell which prove that this reluctance was real, Fleetwood was recalled to England very soon after the coming of Henry Cromwell to Ireland. He landed in Ireland in July 1655, and Fleetwood left in September. The latter still retained his title of Lord Lieutenant, so that Cromwell was merely his deputy, the position which he had intended Disborough to fill. The object of the change in the government of Ireland was to substitute a settled civil government for the rule of a clique of officers, and to put an end to the influence of the Anabaptists, who had hitherto monopolized the direction of the government. The policy of Cromwell towards the native Irish was very little milder than that of his predecessor. His earliest letters show him zealously engaged in shipping young women, and boys to populate Jamaica. He suggested to Thurlow the exportation of 1,500 or 2,000 young boys of 12 or 14 years of age. He does not seem to have sought to mitigate the rigor of the transplantation or to have considered it either unjust or impolitic. On the other hand, his religious views were more liberal, and he remonstrated against the oath of abjuration imposed on the Irish Catholics in 1657. What distinguished Cromwell's administration from that of Fleetwood was the different policy adopted by him towards the English colony in Ireland. Instead of conducting the government in the interests of the soldiery, and in accordance with their views, he consulted the interests of the old settlers, the ancient Protestant inhabitants of Ireland, 
and was repaid by their confidence and admiration. A letter addressed to the protector by Vincent Gookin, at a time when there was some danger of Cromwell's resignation or removal, shows the feelings with which this party regarded his rule. The Presbyterians and the more moderate sects of independence, hitherto oppressed by the predominance enjoyed by the Anabaptists, expressed a like satisfaction with his government. With the Anabaptist leaders, Cromwell had, in January 1656, an interview in which he very plainly stated his intentions towards them. I told them plainly that they might expect equal liberty in their spiritual and civil concernments with any others, and that I held myself obliged in duty to protect them from being imposed upon by any, as also to keep them from doing the like to others. Liberty in countenance they might expect from me, but to rule me or to rule with me, I should not approve of. This line of conduct he faithfully followed in spite of many provocations. His adversaries were powerful in England, and continually at the ear of the protector, but Oliver, though cherry of praise, and not giving his son all the public support he expected, approved of his conduct in this matter. At the same time he warned him against being over-jealous, and making it a business to be too hard for those who contested with him. C.H. Firth states in the Dictionary of National Biography, that in truth Henry's great weakness lay in the fact that he was too sensitive and irritable. His letters are a long series of complaints, and he continually talks of resigning his office. One of the first of his troubles was the mutinous condition of Ludlow's regiment, which he took the precaution of disbanding as soon as possible. Then, without Cromwell's knowledge, petitions were got up by his partisans for his appointment to Fleetwood's post, which afforded Hewson and other Anabaptists the opportunity of public protests on behalf of their old commander, in which they identified the deputy's supporters with the enemies of the godly interest. In November 1656, two generals and a couple of colonels simultaneously threw up their commissions on account of their dissatisfaction with Henry's policy. Just as Cromwell was congratulating himself that the opposition of the Anabaptists was finally crushed, he was involved in fresh perplexities by the intrigues and resignation of Steele, the Irish Chancellor. After the second foundation of the Protectorate by the Petition and advice, Cromwell was at length appointed Lord Lieutenant by commission dated 16 November 1657. His new rank gave him more dignity and more responsibility, but did not increase his power or put an end to his difficulties. His promotion was accompanied by the appointment of a new Irish council, the major art of whom, wrote Henry to his brother Richard, were men of a professed spirit of contradiction to whatsoever I would have, and took counsel together how to lay wait for me without a cause. His popularity was shown by a vote of Parliament on 8 June 1657, settling upon him lands to the value of fifteen hundred pounds in year which he refused on the ground of the poverty of Ireland and the indebtedness of England. At the time of Cromwell's appointment the pay of the Irish army was eight months in arrears and one hundred eighty thousand pounds. The difficulty of obtaining this money, as also the appointment of the hostile councillors, he attributed to his adversaries in the Protector's Council. Those who were against my coming to this employment, by keeping back our monies, have an after-game to play, for it is impossible for me to continue in this place upon so huge disadvantages. He was also charged to disband a large part of the Irish army, but not allowed to have a voice in the management of disbanding. Cromwell endeavoured to devise means of raising the money to pay them in Ireland, but found the country was too poor, and the tax is far heavier than in England. By using the utmost economy, he wrote, that one hundred ninety-six thousand pounds would be sufficed for the present, but all he seems to have obtained was the promise of thirty thousand pounds. In the opinion of Firth, to have succeeded under such unfavorable circumstances in maintaining tranquillity and apparent contentment is no small proof of Cromwell's ability as a ruler. The hypocrisy of men may be deep, he wrote in April 1658, but really any indifferent spectator would gather, from the seeming unanimity and affection of the people of Ireland, that His Highness's interest is irresistible here. 
the adversaries who rendered the task of governing ireland so burdensome appear to have been the leaders of the military party who surrounded the protector henry cromwell frequently refers to them in terms of dislike and distrust especially in his letters to thurlow during sixteen fifty seven and sixteen fifty eight he considered them as opposed to any legal settlement and desirous to perpetuate their own arbitrary power on the question of the acceptance of the crown offered to his father in sixteen fifty seven his own views were almost exactly the same as those of the protector himself from the first henry held the constitution sketched in the articles of the petition and advice to be a most excellent structure and was taken by the prospect of obtaining a parliamentary basis for the protectorate but the title of king a gaudy feather in the hat of authority he held a thing of too slight importance to be the subject of earnest contention both directly and through thurlow he urged his father to refuse the title but to endeavour to obtain the new constitutional settlement offered him by parliament with it the sudden dissolution of the second protectorate parliament in february sixteen fifty eight was a great blow to cromwell's hopes of settlement and he expressed his fears lest the protector should be induced again to resort to non-legal or extra-legal ways of raising money now john lambert was removed the odium of such things would fall nearer his highness errors in raising money were the most compendious ways to cause a general discontent he advised the calling of a new parliament as soon as possible but it should be preceded by the remodelling of the army and the cashiering of turbulent officers he opposed the proposal to tax the cavalier party promiscuously but approved the imposition of a test on all members of the approaching parliament cromwell's great aim was to found the protectorate on as broad a basis as possible to free it from the control of the military leaders and to rally to its support as many of the royalists and old parliamentarians as possible he knew that the maintenance of the existing state of affairs depended solely on the life of the protector the news of his father's illness and the uncertainty as to his successor redoubled cromwell's fears the announcement that the protector had before dying nominated richard cromwell was very welcome to henry i was relieved by it he wrote to richard not only upon the public consideration but even upon the account of the goodness of god to our poor family who hath preserved us from the contempt of the enemy there is no sign that cromwell ever sought or desired the succession himself as the protector's death had determined his existing commission as lord deputy he now received a new one but with the higher title of lieutenant and governor-general it was with great reluctance that cromwell was persuaded to accept the renewal of his commission he was anxious to come over to england not only for the benefit of his own health but after he had agreed to continue in the government of ireland in order to confer with richard and his friends in england on the principles of irish policy and on the prospects and plans of the new government in england however both thurlow and lord broghill strongly urged him not to come the former wrote that his continuance in ireland and at the head of so good an army was one of the greatest safeguards of his brother's rule in england and broghill added neither ireland nor harry cromwell are safe if separated at dublin therefore he remained watching with anxiety the gathering of the storm in england and hoping that parliament would bring some remedy to the distempers of the army the meetings of the officers in london and the manifesto published by them roused him to vehement expostulation on twenty october sixteen fifty eight with fleetwood whom they had petitioned the protector to appoint commander-in-chief he was wroth at the slight to his brother but still more at the aspersions cast on his father's memory and above all things distressed by the prospect of renewed civil war for the next few months cromwell's letters are unusually few and short caused in part by his attacks of illness in part by the tact that he knew his letters were not secure cromwell's numerous correspondence in england kept him well informed of the progress of events there but he bitterly complains that for some time before the dissolution of the third protectorate parliament he had received no letters from the protector in answer to the letter of the english army leaders which announced the fall of his brother's government he sent an ambiguous reply assuring them of the peaceable disposition of the irish army 
and commissioning three officers to represent their views in England. It is plain that he regarded his brother still as the legitimate governor, and was prepared to act for his restoration, if so commanded. During this period of suspense the hopes of the Royalists' cavaliers rose high, and more than one overture was made to Henry on behalf of Charles Roman II. Lord Falconbridge and possibly Lord Broghill seem to have been the agents employed in this negotiation, but nothing was more opposed to the views of Henry than to promote the restoration of the Stuarts. My opinion, he wrote on 21 March 1659, is that any extreme is more tolerable than returning to Charles Stuart. Other disasters are temporary, and may be mended, those not. The principles Cromwell had expressed in his reproof to Fleetwood forbade him to use his army for personal ends or seek to impose its will on the nation. Accordingly, after vainly awaiting the expected instructions from Richard, and receiving from others credible notice of his brother's acquiescence in the late revolution, Henry on 15 June forwarded his own submission to the new government. Before receiving this letter, Parliament, the restored rump, on 7 June had ordered him to deliver up the government of Ireland and return to England. Obeying their orders, he reached England about the end of June, gave an account of his conduct there to the Council of State on 6 July, and then retired to Cambridgeshire. Later Life For the remainder of his life, Cromwell lived in obscurity. He lost, in consequence of the Restoration, lands in England to the value of £2,000, with the pay he had received during his service in Ireland, he had purchased an estate worth between six and seven hundred a year, which he succeeded in retaining. In his petition to Charles Roman II for that object, Cromwell urged that his actions had been dictated by natural duty to his father, not by any malice against the king. He pleaded the merits of his government of Ireland, and the favor he had shown the royalists during the time of his power, Clarendon, Ormond, and many other royalists exerted their influence in his favor. Accordingly, the lands of Cromwell in Meath and Connaught were confirmed to his trustees by a special proviso of the Act of Settlement, but his family seems to have lost them in the next generation. They are said to have been illegally dispossessed by some of the Clan Ricard family, the ancient owners of the land bought by Henry Cromwell's arrears. During the latter years of his life, Cromwell resided at Spinney Abbey in Wiccan, Cambridgeshire, which he purchased in 1661. King Charles Roman II seems to have been satisfied of Cromwell's peaceableness, for though more than once denounced by informers, he was never disquieted on that account. Noble collects several anecdotes of doubtful authority concerning the relations of Charles Roman II and Cromwell. He died on 23 March 1674 O.S., in the 47th year of his age, and was buried at Wiccan Church in Cambridgeshire. Family On 10 May 1653, Cromwell married Elizabeth, died 7 April 1687, daughter of Sir Francis Russell. They had five sons and two daughters, the history of whose descendants is elaborately traced by Noble and Whalen. His second son, Henry Cromwell, married Hannah Hewling, sister of the two Hewlings executed in 1686 for their share in Monmouth's rebellion, and died in 1711, a major in Fielding's regiment. Ancestry